but it's actually going to be effective. On the other hand, you can have an antenna that's really not very resonant and so forth, but it radiates like crazy and you make contacts with it. So uh, there's a little bit of magic in that too that I, I never really fully understood. But you know, you hear stories of people loading up the fence outside the yard and bed springs and you know, the old jokes. But uh, I've, I've used some pretty funky antennas and, and worked, worked the world. Um, so taking these radios out to the field is a lot of fun. Sometimes you can just use a very simple radio, a very simple wire antenna. If you get up high enough on a mountain, you don't even have to worry about a pole. Just throw the wire out on the ground, on the rocky ground. It's, you got you got the best tower in the world at 9,000 feet, right? So uh, it doesn't, uh, not so bad. A lot of the gel cell batteries now are being replaced. A lot of people are using uh, battery packs. Um, like lithium ion packs and stuff like that, uh, that are smaller, lighter, and uh, very capable. The only problem with a lot of those is that they're five volt, right, for your phone. So you have to do a little bit of magic to get them to 12 volts. Um, everybody familiar with the term DX? I uh, was explaining this to my girlfriend yesterday. I said, the first time I'd ever seen the term DX, was uh, this girlfriend I had in high school, had a, her mother had a, a Mercedes Benz and the radio, it was a blob pump radio and had a button on it that said DX. And I asked her, what's that for? She says, well, that's when you have an FM station that's far away. Okay, I get that. So DX is stations that are far away. Usually we're saying foreign countries, right? Okay. Again, uh, the idea about DXing is um, you, you, if possible, you want to be tuning around and hear that guy before his call gets out onto the internet and 5,000 stations descend on the frequency. So if you can kind of, <laughs> kind of get in there before the, uh, the pileup, you're, you're, you're going to be in good shape. And uh, it's probably not going to be very effective to sit on a frequency and call CQ. Although I have this theory about dead bands. I don't know if it's the same theory you have, but you know, you flip over to, let's say, 15, you don't hear anything. And there's 10,000 other people that have flipped over to 15, they don't hear anything. Because nobody's tried to put a signal out on the pan <laughs> to be the first person that's going to say, oh, 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 yeah. Just listen on the contest day. Right? On the, the contest day, all the bands are busy, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Contesting is a lot of fun. Um, of course, field day is my favorite thing. I love field day. Uh, I, 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 I could run the whole, you know. Last, last year, I actually um, left my radio club in, in Princeton, and they were really upset with me. But I went to a place in Connecticut where they had tri-band beams hanging from trees about 50 feet up, right? And they were fixed in, you know, one position. Obviously, you can't rotate them. But best antennas ever. They had 100 foot tall trees. It was amazing. And I'm running QRP, right? And I, I worked anything I could hear, I could, I could work. And uh, we, I think we finished <coughs> second or something like that in the country uh, for our whatever we were, 3A, I guess. But uh, it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. And, uh, but, you know, contests don't have to be 24 hours or 48 hours. There are a number of QR, QRP uh, clubs. In fact, there's two here, SKCC, Straight Key Century Club, and the NAQCC, which is the North American QRP Century Club, um, that have contests all year round. How about Tuesday night for two hours or something? That's a contest. You know, so you don't have to invest an entire weekend or you know, pack up your stuff and go up to a mountain. There's lots of these little things going on all the time. And it's a great way to hone your skills and you know, test out your, your equipment. So I guess everybody wants to know, will somebody hear me if I run five watts? And again, <clears throat> you can actually uh, run tests, just keep cranking down your power and power until the other guy can't hear you. One of my favorite things is when people say, you're running how much? What? Nah. 
Can you run VHF QRP or UHF QRP? Absolutely. Sure. As a matter of fact, this little 817 here, believe it or not, this radio covers 160 meters through 432, 440. All modes. AM, FM, sideband, CW, digital modes with cable. In fact, this is, uh, this is it's called a TNC, internal remote control signaling. It's plugged in the back of it. Five watts. So uh, a lot of the equipment is, uh, is homebrew. Uh, I ran a number of contests with Joe Taylor, K1JT, who, by the way, uh, you may, may know, uh, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1993. And the cool thing that he won the Nobel Prize for was he discovered binary pulsars out in space, looking the other way, and uh, was able to receive the signals from these uh, objects uh, using the uh, giant uh, radio telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. It's kind of carved into a valley and whatnot. And uh, so I guess he had this idea. He said, well, you know what, if I'm listening to weak signals from outer space, millions of light years away, well, why don't I just, you know, modify the software a little bit so I can hear weak signals here on Earth. So all that stuff that you know about, JT65, JT9, FT8, Whisper, all of those are variations on those original Fortran programs that uh, Joe, it's just Joe, Joe wrote to hear these objects, these faint objects far, far away. Now, look, by the way, a lot of the work that he did led to the uh, discovery of gravitational lensing and, um, and even the gravity waves that uh, you hear about now. So, really cool guy, really, really nice guy. But uh, I would operate from his house, uh, VHF, UHF contest, especially a January contest, and uh, you know, he has racks and stacks in his uh, basement and most of the equipment that he had there was all home there. And not running you know, huge amounts of power. Even more challenging is this QRPP. So if you, you know, you're kind of bored with the five watts or so, you can uh, crank things down even lower. One of my friends worked in Morocco at 200 milliwatts. Of course, one of the things that we're not saying here that you're probably saying to yourself, I'm sure, is that even if you've got kind of an okay antenna, the guy in Morocco probably has stacked 20 meter beams, you know, and he's hearing you because his antenna is really great. So that helps. It does help. It's not always on our side. As I said, the digital modes are great, a lot of fun. Um, I've worked meteor scatter. You ever hear that? You're gonna love this story. I said to Joe, I said, we're gonna bounce signals off of ion trails from meteors. I said, don't we have to wait until nighttime? He just looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> he says, no, he says, Jerry, meteors come in like 24 hours a day to come into our atmosphere. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they are there. <laughs> but uh, you can typically work because of the because of the place of the ionosphere, the altitude where the meteors come in. If you work out the trigonometry of it, you can work about 1,200 to 1,500 miles away by bouncing radio signals off of the meteor trails. Okay, pretty crazy. During the contest. Uh, one year, we heard a station in G Germany uh, has a ping on the, uh, we didn't work them, but we heard them. And all we can think of is that somehow or another, it must have taken a hop. Off, started off in the meteor trail and then hopped at least once to get to us, because the, you know, 1,200, 1,500 miles is about the maximum. But really cool stuff. Bouncing signals off the moon, moon bounce. Moon bounce, you typically need a little bit more power, but it's not like the old days where you needed a 28-foot dish and a kilowatt uh, because the receivers are so good and the digital modes are, are amazing. 
terms of weak signal. Uh, we, there was an experiment that was done a couple of years ago. Joe Taylor went down to uh, Puerto Rico and uh, fired up the ham, you know, the ham transmitter down there, and bounced some signals off the moon, and his signals were copyable on a handheld walkie-talkie. Well, of course, I don't know how much the effective radiated power is out of that antenna when you pump a kilowatt into it. It's pretty amazing. So lots of uh, lots of radios available. Um, uh, Yezu actually has a new version of the uh, FT817 out. They call it the 818. I looked at pictures of it, looked at the specs, and other than it being six watts instead of five watts, I don't see any difference. Pretty much the same radio. Uh, Ten Tech is back in the news. Ten Tech was out of business for a while. They're a Tennessee company. You know, oh, I, I, I got to buy American. Uh, you, can, so you can buy Ten Tech now. You can buy Elgraph. They're all American companies. Most of these smaller uh, <coughs> companies are guys working in their basement. They're not, uh, you know, not big companies or anything like that. Um, there's some older equipment. Some of the Heathkit radios are still around. They're, they're actually very, you know, valued. I mean, they got stupid prices for HW8s. Really? Tentex. Uh, Tentex actually uh, has a bunch of radios. And one of the things that's really great about the Tentex radios is, if you're a Morse code CW operator, uh, they always supported full break in. So they always supported the really good mode for Morse code so you can actually hear when you're transmitting you actually hear the other guy break in. Very, very nice radios. Lots of clubs out there. I just picked three of them. NorCal <coughs> is probably one of the most famous. They've been around for a long time. They've got a bunch of different kits. Uh, the New Jersey QRP Club, which I belong to since its inception, uh, has a bunch of different kits uh, through the years. Um, and I'll show you this SDR cube system. Uh, the St. Louis Club is another good club. And then I just got a, I have just a bunch of pictures of things that I want to show you. Just roll through, roll, roll through them pretty quickly. And there's some links. There's the KX1 that I showed you. Uh, open up the bottom, stick uh, half a dozen AA batteries in it, and you get about a couple of watts out. I would not, if you if you bought a brand new one and you had it you know, from somebody, unused kit or something, and they wanted to sight the paddle and tell them to keep the paddle on the ground. I, I, I can't make it work well. But you can unplug it and just plug your own keyer into the keyer paddle. The KX2 uh, is one of uh, Elecraft's newer radios. Uh, I actually brought with me the, uh, the radios, the KX2. It runs 80 through 10 meters, 10 watts. And I also brought the, uh, the PX3. PX3 is actually a pan adapter, so you can actually see a, a picture of what the band looks like in the radio. Uh, the reason I have it all packaged up and everything is I think I used it twice, and I got a guy offering me 400 bucks for it, so I'll pack it up later on and ship it to him. Uh, for me, QRP has taken just the KX3 out in the field and thrown a wire up in the tree. I don't need all that other stuff. I, I thought it'd be cool to have it, so I bought the kit and built it and uh, so forth. But I don't really use it. Uh, this is the KX3. Again, they're showing you a picture here with the PX3 as well. It's got a built-in antenna tuner. It covers 160 through 6 meters um, and so forth. There's a company, this, this guy's actually, I think he's in England actually, uh, and he's got a bunch of these uh, single band uh, kits that you can use for whisper. Can you move over a little? You're in the... I'm sorry. No, you only need it to move like two inches. <laughs> so this is, um, this is a, a, a kind of a single purpose radio. So it runs whisper, uh, low power, and uh, you can, it has little plug-in uh, modules for different bands. And I, I bought the kit with all the modules and stuff like that. I gave it to my friend Alan, W2AW, to build. And I think it was about two years ago. I still don't have it. It's very busy. <laughs> but that way you can dedicate a, a simple radio to that task if you want to play. This is called the Pixie. 
you can see this has uh, a couple crystal sockets here, 3920 and 3930 or something. That's a complete transceiver. Think about that. In an Altoid stand. Walking dead, anyone? <laughs> Communication with low power. This is called the NorCal 38 Special. This is probably one of the most popular kits ever kitted. I don't know how many thousands of these they've, uh, they've kitted and sold. And you'll, you'll see variations of how people have packaged them up. We've got several. This is George Heron's version of it. You can make it look really professional. Uh, Small Wonders Labs is a, there's a, this guy uh, who has uh, come out with a bunch of really, really nice designs for uh, transceivers, usually single band, a couple of watts. Uh, they're very much in demand if you can get them. It's another one. This is a sideband one. I actually owned one of these for a little while. I don't think I ever made a contact with it though. Again, sideband on Cure Peace, top. Of it. It's another one to see here. All band. Tiny little package. NorCal is a 20 meter one, 40 meter one. This is a company called OHR, four band radio, CW only. This is another sort of modular. This is a 10 tech. As I say, Tentec, now that's been resurrected, has a bunch of new radios out. I, I don't know anything about them. I've, I don't know anybody that owns them or anything. I took a picture of the FT-18, a screenshot, just to show you that it really doesn't look much different than the 870. Same microphone. I even have a homebrew more scope for this thing. supposed to come out in April of this year. I'm guessing <coughs> they probably will have these in Dayton, which is this weekend, right? Dayton. Yeah. This is the Heath kit, HW8. Like I said, these are very much in demand for some reason. Here's that tuna tin I was telling you about, right? It's a transmitter on a tuna fish can. Um, they made a companion kit for the receiver and uh, this guy's name is Dave Herring, and he uh, called the Herring Aid receiver. So George uh, and George Herring and 2APB is a long been uh, one of the uh, driving forces in the New Jersey club. Uh, has come out with some tremendous designs uh, with a couple of other folks in the club, and uh, this is his latest uh, uh, thing. Uh, it's called the SDR Cube. It's a completely self-contained SDR transceiver. You don't need a PC or anything like that. There's just bunches of capabilities for it. Some home paddles. This is a tuner, uh, an antenna tuner in an Altoids tin. This is one packaged up to look more like a commercial one. This is typical stack of things. You got your paddles on the bottom, your transceiver, then your tuner, and then your batteries. But this is more like, this is, to me, this is more like a base station kind of setup. This, have you ever wanted to know what frequency you're on, but you're blind and you can't see the display? Well, this one will tell you what your frequency is in Morse code. The whole board is about the size of a port single chip. Lots of small paddles. I know there's been a, an explosion of interest in tiny little Morse, key, Morse code paddles. And they come in every flavor, description, and size, and cost. There's a guy, uh, have you ever heard of this Begali? He gets like several hundred bucks for his paddles. They're, I mean, they're like a work of art. But uh, people uh, flock to them. I've got one of these, actually. I have kind of a uh, hybrid of this one and that one together. It's, on a, it's a little bit bigger, so it has a little, a little tiny straight key next to the paddle. 
it's not great, but it's okay. You know, if you're backpacking, it's perfect. It weighs nothing. Lots of uh, lots of antennas. Um, you know, as I say, Sam and I were talking about this before. We were talking about loop antennas and end-fed antennas and uh, verticals and stuff like that. I, to me, I've never really had much luck with verticals. I had a um, I had a complete uh, buddy pole set. I sold it to somebody uh, the other day at the tailgate. Just didn't use it. A lot of complexity. You know, it's it's got. It's like very versatile. You could use it on any band. You could set it up to be a vertical, <coughs> set it up to be uh, dipoles. You could do all this kind of stuff, different traps, different taps. But by the time you figured out, you know, how to set it up for the band that you wanted to work, it was time to go home. You know? <laughs> so uh, for me, it just throw a wire up in a tree seems to work pretty well. But there's lots and lots of this stuff out. So one of the things that we used to enjoy at our, our club meetings in New Jersey was our show and tell. People would just bring all their stuff and spread it out. Oh, what's that? That's pretty cool. People snapping pictures of everything. You know? This is another portable stack. The guy put it in a wooden cabinet for his shack. This is uh, one, of the, one of the great guys in the club, uh, Joe N2CX. This guy is famous because he, uh, last year with the National Parks on the Air, he visited, I don't know how many national parks and operated it and you know, made that park available to people that were trying to get you know, those contacts. And he had so much fun riding around the country with his son, uh, an adult son, um, that this year, there's no more national parks on the air, but this year he's been going around all different state parks in different states, up and down the eastern seaboard and stuff. He's just, uh, he's retired from L3. Um, Real smart guy, and he's he's been responsible for a lot of the designs uh, in the NJQRP. Lots of uh, publications out there. A lot of clubs have their own newsletters and stuff. A lot of websites. This is QRP or ARCI. They actually uh, are one of the biggest uh, sort of uh, worldwide clubs, and uh, they have a nice website. This is the New Jersey Club. These are all new uh, screenshots of the web pages. NorCal. This is the uh, GQRP. Uh, at Dayton, a few days before uh, the actual hamvention, there's uh, something called FDIM. Have you ever heard of that? It's called Four Days in May. So this is a, sort of like a mini convention of QRP fans that go prior to Dayton, but they come from all around the world and swap notes and have presentations about QLP stuff. And that's every year it's sponsored by one of these clubs. FDIM, four days in May. So just to kind of tie the ribbon on it, uh, lots of uh, equipment available, low power, low power consumption, lightweight, carried into the field, build your own, all that good stuff. Safer. By the way, did everybody here fill out that form that says that when you operate, your, your equipment is going to be safe for the folks around you? you know, it looks at what frequencies you're on, uh, your antenna, how far away it is for people to remember the interval.